Davey Edwards, a professional land surveyor in Texas and Oklahoma. He has also been uh, duly qualified as a Texas licensed state land surveyor and a U.S. federal land surveyor. He is currently the professor assistant pro professional assistant professor at the Geospatial Systems Engineering Program at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. He is appointed to the director of the State Spatial Reference Center in Con Conrad Booker. Booker Institute Pleasure. of Serving Book, uh, Booker, yeah, <laughs> butcher that. And then Davey is, uh, has a bachelor's degree in biomedical science from Texas A&M University in College Station, a master in geospatial surveying engineering from Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and a doctorate degree in geoscience from the University of Dallas, uh, University of Texas in Dallas. His studies concentrated on land admi ad administrations, good Lord, systems and riparian boundary morphology. And as uh, Nick alluded to just a second ago, he is also our current NSPS uh, vice president as of the, uh, the spring meeting. So I appreciate you uh, jumping on and uh, kind of sharing a little bit of the uh, Texas history and uh, how we kind of get started and where we're going from here. So I appreciate the time, Davey. Ah, not, not a problem. Um, so I want to keep this as open as possible um, and as light as possible. So anybody wants to chip in, chime in anytime, uh, that's great. Um, really difficult to do right now, but I usually try to get an idea of who I'm talking to. But um, how many people are licensed in Texas? Mm, I would bet. I don't think any on here tonight. Okay. All right, then I can lie and you won't ever know. That's right. Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. This is Steve Parrish. When I was I working Steve. in Albuquerque with the Forest yes. Service, I had the opportunity twice to come and give some workshops. Went in Austin and went up in uh, Houston. Uh -huh. And after learning more about uh, Texas surveys, I, uh, I said if I was ever involved in Western Texas with surveys, I would certainly get somebody from Texas to do that work. So uh, I, I said, no, I'm never going to become a Texas surveyor, but <laughs> you're a lighthearted, great group to work around, I'll tell you. Uh, you got to be in our profession, that's for sure. Um, so when Trent approached me uh, to talk about on, you know, anything on Mentor Mondays, um, I was trying to figure out, okay, well, what do I talk about? And of course, I went back and looked at a couple of older um, uh, mentors, and I thought, you know, um, I, 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 I can try to talk about surveying in Texas, and I'd love to. I'm, I'm glad to talk about it. Uh, that's something that, you know, I teach down here at A&M uh, right now. I'm, I'm a professor down here, and I teach this, uh, but we also kind of wrap around um, what is the differences? Uh, you know, we have our colonial states, we have our public land systems, we have things that we don't even understand in Louisiana, uh, but then you got Texas. Um, so when I was looking at, okay, what do I talk about? Uh, I, and I told Trent this a while ago, I, we got about three classes we teach here uh, that uh, we spend a whole semester on history, the cadastral system, legals, you know, and, and try to put that into a one hour presentation. Uh, but then I, I, I threw this together today and I thought, okay, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the legend, the myth, the reality of surveying in Texas. Uh, and so I, I threw together this slide. And like I said, anytime guys, y'all have a question, whatever, chime in, uh, we'll talk about it in more detail. We may finish it, we may not. Let's see where it takes us. So the objective, uh, is of course the legend of Texas. You know, what's the history? Um, I gave a presentation to um, uh, seventh grade Texas history students uh, here at a local school, local junior high. Uh, and, I, you know, they covered the history of Texas. And I thought, you know, here is a perfect opportunity for surveyors to just kind of needle their way into this and talk about, okay, you've talked about you know, the history of Texas, you know, what was Spain, you know, how did that happen to, in Texas, you know, what did that mean to the surveyors in Texas, so you had all these little things like oil, the discovery of oil, you know, 
where does that put Texas on the map, and especially in surveying? So, you know, try to try to plant that seed, that little mustard seed, and hope that it grows into something where now we have students that instead of thinking, hey, I got to be an engineer, or I got to be a doctor, or I got to be uh, an astrophysicist, why not be a surveyor? It's, it's one of those big uh, industries that is needing more surveyors every day. So um, that's the history. Uh, let's talk about that on, in, today. Uh, the myth of Texas, the cadastral system, you know, just like Steve alluded to, you know, hey, I, I've been down there. I've heard what you do down there. I'm not even going to touch it. You know, um, the PLS system, we have a manual that we follow. Uh, everything's kind of laid out. You know, when you're trying to do an original land grant survey, it's laid out there. Um, but in Texas, we don't have this manual. Uh, we have a, a hodgepodge of different things that go on, but what dictates that? Well, we look at different things. We look at statutory law. We look at case law. We look at the legend of Texas, the history, what was involved in that. And then the reality. What's the reality of surveying in Texas? Can, can we do that? And, and of course, my answer at the end of the day is yes. It, it is something that we can all do. So not what you think. So let's start with the, the Texas, the, the legend, the history. All right, so look, you got to kind of think of Texas as three different things. You know, we're going to look at three different things in Texas. And of course, the very first thing I tell every history student is, what is the big thing about Texas? You know, you think of Texas, what do you think about? And, and I'm talking mainly to Texas uh, students. So they kind of have an idea, but you know, I'll throw that out there to y'all. What do you think about when you think about Texas and Texas history? What stands out to y'all? Doesn't have to be surveying. The Cowboys. <laughs> the Cowboys, okay. Is that the football team? The Alamo. The Alamo, we're getting closer there. The history of Texas grants. itself, is, as far as being a state and being its own country, yep, being its own country. All right, so y'all are y'all are kind of getting into that area. I see there's a couple of chats up here. Uh, Alamo, no PLS. Yeah, there you go. There's there's no federal land grants here. Um, but the six flags of Texas. Everybody's kind of heard of the six flags of Texas, you know, and that that represented the six different governments that were. Uh, part of Texas that made Texas what it is. Uh, and so when we think of Texas, we think of those six. Now, not all six of them played a part in our land administration system. Only a few of them did, and a few of them made huge impacts to what we do every day. So let me get this thing working again. There we go. So the first map I show here is Texas. And of course, Texas here does not look like the Texas, even the Republic of Texas. This is a Texas. This is when it was. This is when it was a part of Mexico. When it was really when it's Spanish government going into the Mexican government. Uh, and you can see here we have Texas. And Texas is. I don't know if you see my cursor, but it's it's not the shape that we think. Um, Texas took on a part of other things. Uh, you can see that whenever we look at the Republic of Texas, we look at a huge area. Uh, and this is the area that, that when Texas became a republic, they claimed all of this land. Uh, and, and rivers were important to these boundaries. And so when you look at the Republic of Texas and then you kind of compare that to what um, the Spanish-Mexican Texas looked like, we're taking in three other states of Mexico at the time. We took in Coelho, we took in Tamaulipas, um, and of course we took in uncharted areas of Mexico, Spain area. And then we have Texas as a state, uh, finally ending up with the shape that everybody's used to seeing. Uh, and, and of course, when we end up with that shape, we have additional history that was involved in that. So how did we get to where we got to? As the United States was really coming into shape, you can see over on the East Coast, we have our original colonies. They're really taking shape and everything. 
Uh, if y'all are familiar, this is the, the Malesh map of the United States, 1821. Um, and you can see that as it moves to the west, you're starting to lose a lot of detail because it was unexplored. Uh, and you can see the shape of Texas here. And of course, this map is the map that was actually used in a, in a really interesting treaty that helped form the eastern shape, the eastern and northeastern shape of Texas. Um, so Texas, before Texas was Texas, when it was a part of Spain, there was this fuzzy area. The United States just recently purchased what they call the Louisiana Purchase. And the boundary between the two was really vague. They, they kind of had, well, what do we do here? You know, we know we got part over here, but is it a part over there? So they kind of came together and they formed a treaty. It's called the adams O'Neill Treaty of 1819. And, and that treaty called out a couple of rivers. It called out the Sabine River. And the Sabine River is right there at the mouth of the Gulf of Mexico. And it goes up a little ways. And then it gets to a certain latitude, and then it goes north until it gets to the Rio Rojo, the Red River. And then it follows the Red River until it gets to a meridian, the 100th meridian, goes north until it hits the Arkansas River. And of course, it goes up that Arkansas River until it gets to a point where it's at the head of the Arkansas River, and then it goes north until it gets to the 42nd uh, latitude. Then it goes to the Gulf of Mexico, or to, to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so that was the division that was really called out. And of course, you can see here that the Red River did not look the way it looks right in this map, uh, but it, it called out natural features. Uh, and these natural features are something that are the highest dignity of calls. And these are things that uh, both countries could agree upon because, hey, we see them, we know where it's at, it's not this fictitious line that's sitting out on the ground. We can put it back on the ground wherever that river is. Okay, so that that helped form the state of Texas. So Texas, the myth. We have to talk about the history of Texas. So where did Texas start to get its shape? Is in the Spanish-Mexican era. Ah, yes, Steve. You're, you're, you're beating me to, the, uh, to my punchlines. <laughs> Good job, Steve. All right, so the Spanish-Mexican era. Uh, what you see here in this image is uh, what we call porciones. Uh, the porciones were along the Rio Grande, and they were granted along the Rio Grande. And what they were is they were, they were actually a league of land that stretched out uh, from the river uh, and, and just went a long distance out, and it gave people, you know, access to water, which if you've ever been in South Texas, you know you need water. Of course, this area of South Texas uh, is, is very good in, in growing uh, your citrus crops. Uh, so it's something that, you know, the, the, the Spaniards in, in New Spain uh, were trying to make a living. You know, they, they raised crops, they raised cattle, uh, and they needed access to water. So this is the parts of the original land grant. But we have to look at what was the law at the time, all right? So Spain was under the civil law, all right? And they got this from, from Roman government. Uh, and they included that into their system, and they called it the Siete Partidas, the seven parts. Uh, this helped form their government, uh, but that was important to the cadastral systems and how you, how you uh, laid out riparian boundaries uh, and littoral boundaries. Uh, so we have the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, a couple of things about these is riparian boundaries is the bed of the river was held back for sovereignty. It, it kept it back into the crown. Uh, they kept the bed of the river uh, and the waters of the river were there to be used, but nobody could own the bed of the river. Uh, and in the littoral boundaries, it was uh, at the mean high, high tide. Uh, so it came up uh, where sovereign was all submerged out in the Gulf of Mexico, but it came up on land a good distance because of the mean higher high tide. This is particularly important along 
uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico, especially in the South Texas area where we have really flat lands. Uh, so we have bays uh, and estuaries where the actual mean high or high tide goes in several, several miles from where uh, low tide would be. So <clears throat> it, it plays an important role in if you get a Mexican or Spanish land grant, you have to apply these laws uh, where the grant was first originated from, okay? Of course, what the deal was uh, is Spain wanted to get missions out there. Uh, they were trying to hold on to their territory, especially in an area where the United States was trying to move westward, okay? And, and that movement westward, uh, they were afraid they were going to lose their land. So they were out there in the furthest reaches from uh, the central government. And what they were trying to set up were missions to convert the Indian tribes into Catholicism. Uh, and and the, they were gonna try to make them Spanish citizens. Uh, and, and of course, that didn't work out to their advantage. Uh, there were some that would convert, but a lot of times they didn't. And of course, where you had missions, you had military uh, presence. And, and of course, where you had all that, you had growth of towns. And of course, the famous one that everybody knows in Texas is the Alamo. Uh, and that took, took shape in San Antonio. Uh, it was on a river. Uh, there was a good uh, uh, town that was growing around the mission and the fort. Uh, so, so that was why you know those missions were established out there but there came along uh, a couple of anglos from the united states that said hey we would love to try to set up some colonies and of course the famous one uh in texas was moses austin now moses austin talked to the spanish government convince the Spanish government to, to allow him to be what they called an impresario. And of course, an impresario was kind of like a mayor, uh, but he was also the person that would go out into um, any other country, try to bring them into uh, the Spanish area, the colony, uh, and, and allow him to give them the land. And of course, they set up what they call the colonial laws colonialization laws, uh, and, the, and the first ones were out of the Spanish uh, government, and they kind of gave instructions. Of course, these instructions for surveying at the time was how much land you got. So if you were coming in as a head of household and you were going to raise a farm, uh, you got a certain amount of land, maybe a league and a little more. Uh, if you um, were wanting to raise cattle, you might have gotten more. You might have gotten a sitio. Uh, so there were certain uh, things that were attached to that, though. Uh, if you came over and they gave you land, you had to have it surveyed and described. And of course, the um, impresario was usually the surveyor. Uh, and then once he went out and surveyed it, then it was returned. But to settle on that land, you had to take an oath to the Spanish government uh, and become a Spanish citizen. And you had to convert to Catholicism, uh, which was a little bit difficult for a lot of the Europeans that were coming over uh, because they weren't coming over with the same religion uh, as Spain was at the time. So this didn't quite occur uh, under the Spanish government. He was given the land, but he didn't quite see it through. Instead, Stephen F. Austin, which you may or may not have heard, his son was the one that brought over the majority of the families, and it was under the Mexican government, which the Mexican government carried over uh, the, the Spanish uh, colonial laws. And so Mexico then got uh, claimed their independence in 1821. Uh, and so at that time, they fought, got their independence, and become a, a part of Mexico. I'm trying to keep up with the chat too while y'all are saying that. Yes. And <clears throat> I was going to get to that, uh, Michael. Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
so Michael asked in the chat if if um, where where those documents were filed. So if a, if a, a colon uh, if you got land out of a, a colony, um, you had it described. They they gave you the land grant, and it became a Spanish land grant. And of course, when when a, a government uh, in this case, Mexico uh, um, got its succession from the Spanish government, they they adopted all of the titles and and carried them forward. Uh, and so those uh, grants were typically kept in the colony. And there were several colonies eventually, but they were typically kept in the colony. Today, they're found at the Texas General Land Office, and yes, you, you can have access to them. That's a short story on that. All right, and so Austin colonies, uh, the, those were the most famous colonies out of the, out of the uh, Mexican government. And of course, Mexico is still giving land uh, to their own uh, citizens, uh, and there were hugely huge grants uh, most of them occurred in the South Texas area where I'm at right now here, south of the Oasis River, uh, north of the Rio Grande, uh, but uh, there were several of them out there, which we can go into later. Um, and so, Michael, here's, here's one of them. Uh, this is actually Stephen F. Austin's land grant uh, in his own colony. Um, what do y'all notice about the land grant here? It's in Spanish. It's in Spanish. Not only is it in Spanish, it's in old Spanish. Uh, sometimes the words aren't translatable anymore. Um, we had a, um, uh, a Hispanic uh, a lady working with us, and she would help me translate some of these sometimes. Um, but the, the thing about this, and the reason that I wanted to point this one out is, this is still an original land grant that exists in Texas. And even though it's written in Spanish, doesn't make it any less important. Uh, but just a side note of that, most field notes that were in the Spanish land grants were written in English first uh, because you had an English surveyor. And usually it was English uh, speaking uh, grantees that were actually receiving the grants. Um, and so they would translate that to Spanish. And then today, uh, one of the statutory positions at the Texas General Land Office is a Spanish translator. And his job is, is to take the Spanish field notes and translate them back to English. Uh, so they went from English to Spanish and then from back into English. So you ever heard of loss in translation? This sometimes is a perfect case, <laughs> especially when you start to see these and you can't read them. That's, I mean, the script is, is really difficult to read sometimes. And so, like I said, some of the letters, some of the translations are, are not there anymore. But this is Stephen F. Austin's grant. So as history would tell you, um, you know, the people that were living here were not getting representation. They were under an oppressive government. Uh, so they revolted and won our independence and we became the Republic of Texas. So one of the governments were the Republic of Texas. We were our own independent government. Um, and with that, we also said, hey, we validate any Mexican or Spanish titles. Uh, all you have to do is just let us know. And so we formed a, 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 a land office. Uh, that was the very first agency ever established in the Republic of Texas was the Texas General Land Office, which still exists today. It's the oldest agency in the state. Um, and that, um, that job was to validate, their first job was to validate all the Spanish and Mexican land titles, but also to continue to bring in new uh, people. And they did this through head rights. And the head rights was kind of like those colonies, but we had a lot of vacant land. Uh, we were poor. Uh, we had war debt, but we had a lot of land. And so 
if you came over and you're a head of household, you've got usually a section of land. Uh, if you were a single man, you usually got a, a half a section. And of course, they dwindled down through the years. Uh, but that was some of the first things that they would put up is a head right. First class head right, second class head right. And, and depending on the era, that's what you got. Another thing is we had no money. Uh, so how were we going to pay uh, the people that helped us to defend our rights? Uh, so we set up bounties and donations to give to the families of the Alamo and, and to give to those war heroes that, that won our independence. And there, there are a lot of them out there, like Davy Crockett, uh, Jim Bowie. Uh, they are all out there, even Sam Houston. But one thing is, we realized we were not going to make it. We were struggling. And so we needed to move into the United States. Uh, that was our only saving factor, uh, is we couldn't pay off our war debt. It wasn't growing as fast as we needed. We were the gap, we were the bridge uh, for a transcontinental railroad uh, to go south of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and we, we were wanting to get that way. But because the United States was under a common law, Texas decided that was the route we needed to take. So about halfway through the Republic, we switched over to a common law government. That changed our land grants. Again, Instead of just any perennial stream running through land grants being sovereign to the crown, or in this case, sovereign to the government, <clears throat> it had to be a statutory definition of a navigable river. Uh, also, along the littoral boundaries, along the Gulf of Mexico, instead of them being the mean higher high tide, we now move down to the mean high tide, giving more land to the upland owners, the people that were getting the grants, and less land for the sovereignty. Uh, thanks, Nick. I'm not that old, though. Um, I have to tell you, uh, my mom was a Texas history teacher in junior high, and I had her uh, when I was going through junior high. I did not like history. That was one thing I did not like. It wasn't until I really got into uh, studying to be a surveyor uh, that I fell in love with it. And of course, it has to be history that involves surveying. Uh, other than that, <laughs> forget it. Um, so we get to move into the state, and it wasn't an easy thing. We had a couple of things we had to do. First off, we had what they called the Mexican-American War. All right. Remember I told you about Texas, and remember the map when it was part of Texas and Cuilla and Tamaulipas? Okay. Well, the border, the south border of Texas, when it was under Spanish, when the state of Texas was under Spanish law, went to the Nueces River. So you had an area between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande that was still disputed between the Republic of Texas and Mexico. And a lot of land grants didn't get taken care of during that time. Uh, they didn't validate because if you were it, south of the Nueces River and you hold a Mexican land title, and you went to validate that in Austin, uh, you could have been killed. Santa Ana didn't want you to. And he told you that you, didn't, you weren't going to do that. So they were reluctant to go get them validated. And so a lot, and that meant that Texas didn't recognize those titles. Now, under the uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty, uh, after the Mexican American War, um, they tried to set up a commission to go down and investigate that. It's called the Borland Commission. Uh, and, and in that commission, they validated some. And there's still a lot of families that never did get them validated that were left without having any land. Uh, so those things still kind of go on today. And that's mainly between the Oasis River and the Rio Grande. Um, then you had the 1850 Compromise. And the 1850 Compromise um, was where the United States basically said, hey, you're too big. We don't like that. So why don't we pay you, I think it was $10 million, for the areas that were New Mexico, North, North Panhandle of Oklahoma, 
parts of Colorado, parts of Wyoming. Uh, and then instead of like all the other states that were joining the union of relinquishing all their land to the federal government, the federal government said, hey, why don't y'all keep your own land? You have a great system down there. Of course, I think they were just scared of surveying in Texas. Uh, but they, they, would, they basically said, you keep your land and you pay off your own war debt. So not only did we get some money for some land that we gave away, we still were the largest state in the union uh, until Alaska came along. Um, and then uh, we kept our land. There is no federal uh, land in Texas that is was given to them. It's all been acquired. Uh, so our military bases here, uh, the uh, like forest land or uh, grasslands that are in, that are national lands uh, in the state of Texas, they've all been acquired uh, and not and not given to them. Okay, uh, let's see. The 1850 compromise took care of all that, okay? So Texas continued to um, look at this as a win-win situation. And a part of that was, okay, now we can start giving more land. And part of those were the strips. And of course, the railroad strips is what really took off in Texas. Uh, the railroad strips, we would give, and, and of course it changed, uh, but if you were to build a mile of railroad, we would give you X amount of sections so that you could build a mile of railroad. And of course, this was starting to get into the survey instructions. So you lay out your baseline of, for your railroad. That'll be the baseline for your section. You survey off an odd section for your railroad, sell it, and that money will pay for that mile of, of railroad. But you had to survey an even section, call it section two, adjacent to your section. And that goes back to the state of Texas and goes into the permanent school fund to help build our schools. Um, so they would go out and they would survey two sections at a time. And they were sections. Uh, the instructions were to keep them as square as possible, 640 acres, which ended up being 1,900 barrows which is what I want to move to instead of the international foot. Let's just move to the Spanish Vera. We'll be good. Uh, but 1,900 Veras is a mile. All right. So, so now we're starting to see this resemblance of sections in the state of Texas. Uh, and they surveyed them out in twos, in pairs. Now, eventually, as the land decreased in value, that meant as it moved west, into the desert, they had to give more and more land. And one of the biggest uh, railroad uh, survey systems in Texas is called the TMP, the Texas and Pacific Railroad, and it's the 80 mile reserve. That meant for one mile of track, they got 80 sections that they had to survey because it was 80 miles wide, okay? That was primarily in the area where you turn uh, there at Pecos, uh, right the Pecos River all the way to El Paso. And of course, Steve, you'll probably know that area being from New Mexico. Uh, that, that is the closest thing that we have to a sectionalized system out there. And I call it the pseudo sections because there are 48 section blocks uh, and we really didn't have a baseline. The baseline was uh, the border between uh, Texas and New Mexico. <clears throat> And Michael, yes, uh, they did refer to townships, but not necessarily ranges. Uh, what they referred to was blocks, all right? So you did have townships, but you had blocks. Uh, so some of the areas like in West Texas, uh, you may be working in Township 5 uh, South, uh, Block 48. And they, they numbered them from the, uh, the same way, from the North uh, East corner, one, going west through six. So you had six miles across, eight miles south. Uh, so 48 sections going down that way. And there are also eloquent descriptions in those sections. Uh, but um, you'll, for another time, and I'll get to it in a minute, uh, they didn't set every corner. Uh, so you didn't have much to, to go off of. Uh, 
I'm reading yours, Nick. Yeah, and, and of course, yeah, the original line was all, it's all on paper. Uh, so, um, and, and also out there in West Texas, they don't believe in curvature. Uh, so you can't apply the curvature of the earth as well. It's a flat area. I didn't, that's flat earther area out there. Um, and, and then last uh, thing I'll talk about state of Texas is spindle top, all right? So spindle top was in the Beaumont area of Southeast Texas. And that's uh, the biggest oil well. It was discovered in 1900, uh, but that changed everything. So before that, uh, when you got a land grant, you got everything from the center of the earth to the heavens and the sky. But after spindle top, they shut down the release of all land grants and they redid everything to where the state of Texas retained mineral rights. You got a portion of it, but you didn't get all of it. Uh, and, and so that changed the dynamics and really changed the uh, outlook of Texas uh, because Texas was able to retain a lot of their mineral rights, which helped pay uh, for the university. So all your state universities, um, it helped pay for uh, the public schools uh, in Texas especially out in West Texas, where, you know, you have your Permian Basin out there that is just bringing in, still bringing in uh, huge amounts of oil uh, royalties. And that keeps our school systems paid for here. Now, it doesn't pay for everything, uh, but it does help pay a lot. Uh, and that's what it's there for. All right. So the reality. And this was the reality of surveying Texas. All right, so we talked about colonies, uh, but one thing we didn't talk about is how it was originally divided up. And of course, Texas was um, really kind of towards the 19th, 20th century, uh, it was all kind of allocated for. There was supposed to be everything was surveyed, everything was allocated. Um, we knew what was still unpatented land, what was patented land. Uh, and these came through all of the land districts. Uh, so Texas is so large, it couldn't keep up with everything. So they broke them down into districts. And then as population, as um, you know, the development start to uh, increase in certain districts, they broke down into counties. Uh, so, but how things are filed were the original land districts. So if you go to the Texas General Land Office website, you can look up your area and pull out the, the land grant with the original field notes attached, but you have to know what district was it in originally. So if you're in West Texas, you're going to be in the Bear District. And the Bear District originated in Bear County, which is San Antonio. Uh, but then you get into areas over in Southeast Texas, um, you have the Harris District, which is Harris County, and that's Houston. Uh, but up in my original area is Wise County up in the Fannin district. Uh, so any original land grant work I do there, I have to know I'm in the Fannin district. And now I'm in um, the uh, San Patricio district down here in Oasis County in the south uh, part of Texas. Uh, so you have to know your area uh, in order to understand how to research your land grant. Our original land grant system, all right? So we started off with colonies. And of course, this area here is in the area where some of the colonies were. This is a county map. This is how we index everything is through county maps. Um, we, we look at these that, uh, like the one uh, Padilla here, it has a T in front of it. So if I see that T, I know it's a Mexican land title. Uh, and, and it was, uh, originally titled April 6th of 1830. Okay, so Texas didn't come along until 1836. So this was, this was between 1821 and 1836. So this was during the Mexican uh, era. Um, and so you just have to look through all of these to try and find out. Over here, you have the Henry Roth, um, uh, and it's a first class head right. Uh, so this could have been, uh, of course, I'd have to look it up, but this could have been under the Republic of Texas. Uh, 
Uh, so the grant would have been under the Republic of Texas. Uh, so you have a mixture of, of different grants, different time frames throughout the whole state of Texas. And then you have our pseudo sectionalized area out in West Texas. This is in Culberson County. Uh, in Culberson County, you have public school lands and you have university lands, you have the TMP Railroad, uh, you have other railroad companies out there and filling in these gaps. And as you can tell, uh, there are areas where there has not been any patents issued. These are still lands that are unpatent, still sovereign to the state, uh, but they're, they're noted here as being surveyed. Uh, but there are other areas where you have issues with the surveys. Um, and they don't match up exactly right. And what does that mean? So you can see here, these blocks are, are going seven miles long and only five miles deep or four miles deep in this case, okay? So they're not completely like a township and range that you would see in the public land system, but they are mile by mile in some cases. Some cases they're a mile and a quarter by mile and a quarter, but we'll deal with that later. We have our field notes. You have running field notes in the public land systems. We have field notes for each section. And that's the difference. Uh, when we reconstruct, yes, we may have simultaneous surveys done on the same date or near the same date by the same surveyor, but we don't double proportion. Instead, we have to treat each section as an individual uh, in, in areas like that. We have junior, senior rights in some areas. Uh, so you have to know where you're sitting, what's adjacent to you to apply these different laws. And we have field notes you can't read. So unless you're fluent in ancient Spanish, uh, maybe you can, uh, and, and really good at reading script. Uh, you know, my eyes are getting worse and worse every day. Um, my glasses are thicker and thicker. Uh, so, you know, eventually uh, I'm going to hand this off to hopefully some younger surveyors and let them do it. Uh, but I enjoy what I do and I enjoy interpreting these. I enjoy putting them back on the ground in their original uh, capacity. And I've done it before. Uh, these are shots that I've taken out in the field. I was in private practice with my father. I'm a son of a surveyor. That sounds like a cuss word, but um, I, I was born into survey. Um, I, as you could tell when I, and whenever uh, uh, Trent mentioned that my bachelor's is in biomedical science, I tried to run away from it. Um, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon so bad, uh, but um, I circled back around. Uh, medical school didn't want me. I knew I was going to be a doctor, but who knew I was going to be a doctor of surveying? Um, but I... I had fun doing this. I, when I came back and started working with my dad, I thought I'm going to get licensed in 80 states. Um, but the reality is uh, it was to provide my clients something that nobody else could provide them. And it wasn't being licensed in a bunch of states. It was being licensed as much as you can to get a, a project accomplished. Uh, for me, that was to be a, a licensed state land surveyor in Texas, which there's only 59 in the state. Uh, today. We lost one a couple of weeks ago. Um, and of those 59, two-thirds of them are the, over the age of 65. Um, and then to, to be licensed in Oklahoma was to give me, because I lived on the Red River, I was like 20 minutes from the Red River, so I want to be licensed in both states, but then that meant be a federal surveyor as well. Uh, so the Certified Federal Survey Program came around. So so to be able to do that and then go out in the field and find these original land grant monuments, they're still there today. These are just a few pictures of them that I've found over the years throughout the entire state of Texas. And, and some, some in Oklahoma I didn't find. Uh, this monument here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, it's the one with the Jeep. Um, that is one of the Red River monuments that Colonel Stiles and Arthur Kidder set in the Oklahoma v. Texas court, uh, Supreme Court decision. Uh, it was out in the middle of the woods. This area, as you can see in the trees, uh, will get flooded up to four feet when the rivers flood. Um, so it, it's sometimes underwater, uh, but 
uh, we happen to chance find this behind these logs. Uh, and, and if I could zoom in on it, you can see Texas was carved out on one side, Oklahoma on the other. Um, <clears throat> and you can see over here that it says it looks like a, it's upside down, actually. Uh, but it has a D, U, and an M, uh, mud. Um, <clears throat> it was a sandstone uh, that was called out in the uh, original survey. Uh, it was a, it was a, actually on the line. It wasn't a uh, actual corner. Um, but where my pole is here, the Seiko pole, uh, that's a rock mound under a fence. Uh, you can see it there um, with my machete at the bottom. Uh, the one with the mule in the background is a set sandstone out in West Texas. Um, the one above it is a TMP. Uh, the remonumentation of it is the uh, brass cap in the concrete, but the original stone here, you can barely see the T and the P. Uh, the P is more prominent, uh, but that was the original monument that was set in 1876. Um, the one with the field notes that are flying in the wind over here, uh, it used to be a stone mound, but now it's flat. Uh, so we find those every once in a while. And of course, you got to have good help nowadays. Uh, so uh, with Bernie Sanders by my side, uh, he's, he's the guy that I get out there to look at my instruments uh, when I'm having to collect static data. Uh, he's real good at sitting in that chair, staying warm in this Texas heat. So that's it. Um, I, I think I've got a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I do want to point out that uh, on June 17th, uh, the uh, TSPS, Texas Society of Professional Surveyors, the Dallas chapter is hosting a, 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 a virtual um, lecture. I'm going to be the lecturer. Uh, and I'm going to give two different lectures. I'm going to give one on the Red River, surveying on the Red River, uh, which that's my that's my expertise is the Red River. Uh, and the other one, surveying out in West Texas, uh, what it's like out in West Texas. And of course, you get PDHs with this. Uh, so if y'all need PDHs, you, it's up to eight PDHs with this. Um, and so I just wanted to make that plug. If you're interested, uh, you can contact me or you can go to the TSPS website and there's a place you can... Uh, um, get the information there. So I want to open it up for questions. Anybody got any? That was awesome. I'll throw the uh, link in our follow-up email as well, Davey, for to promote that. Okay. Yeah, I did see that when I was uh, searching some stuff for the Red River. That's cool. That'll be a good one. <clears throat> Roberto, go for it. Thanks, Trent. Wonderful presentation. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, what exactly are you serving along the Red River? Okay, so for me, um, and we can put my disclaimer out there. I'm currently working on about three different lawsuits. So if you're on the other side, don't take this with me. Um, but really what I'm working on, I've got a couple of them that are evulsive events uh, that, you know, the 2000 Red River Compact put a lot of um, uh, issues out there that a lot of people don't realize. And, and one of that is, is no matter what caused the river to change course, whether it was avulsion, erosion, or, or accretion, uh, the river, the south bank of the river at the vegetation line is always the jurisdiction line between the two states. Um, that doesn't change tidal ownership. So if you have an avulsive event, you may have land that now lies in the state of Oklahoma if it was granted out of the state of Texas and vice versa. Um, and it puts a really predicament on you know, what do you do with that? Um, because um, as a surveyor, uh, you have to be licensed in both states to do it, or, or you have to get somebody licensed in the other state to help you with it. Because if you're not qualified to do PLS work in the state of Oklahoma, then you can't survey an original Oklahoma land grant that lies south of the Red River. Um, you have to get somebody that's qualified to do that and vice versa. But as a landowner, um, because of the compact, you have to move the land that once was in like a Texas county, uh, if it was granted out of the Texas, out of the state of Texas that lies in Oklahoma, and you have to move it into the state of Oklahoma into their county uh, and vice versa. And, and counties don't understand that. Uh, if it wasn't originally patented out of their state, they don't understand how, did, how do they get it now? Uh, so it left a big issue there. And of course, that's a lot of what I'm working on, uh, Umberto. That's awesome. 
Pat, Pat had a question. Uh, any French claims in Texas? So there wasn't any, there was French occupation, uh, but there wasn't any land grants that were out of the French uh, government. Uh, that primarily stayed in the Louisiana area on the other side of the Sabine River. Gotcha. Anybody else? It's a quiet group tonight. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Cool presentation. Yeah, it was great. Thank I you. love it. Tons Thank of history. You. you thought we had lots of good history out west, but uh, it's good stuff. <laughs> well, I, I know is, is you, you can't survey in Texas unless you know the history. And I always tell my students, what is our job uh, as surveyors? And that's to follow in the footsteps of the original surveyor. Well, you can't follow in the footsteps of the original surveyor unless you understand where he was and how he was there. And you've got to understand the history. And in Texas, that means you've got to study what did that surveyor do in that particular area? What was he known for? What was the monuments that he set? Uh, did he set stone mounds? Did he set a stone mound with maybe an axle? Um, maybe he used particular stones, sandstones all the time. Was his chain near always long? Uh, did he always run a long chain? Instead of being 1,900 barrels, maybe he was always 2,100 barrels. Yeah. Um, these are things that you'd only know if, if you were to research that particular surveyor to follow in his footsteps. Um, and so it, it may be that way here in South Texas, but then when you go to West Texas, you got to learn something entirely new. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what did they do out there? And then then you go up to North Texas, it's, it's entirely different. Uh, so you, you've got, and if you don't feel comfortable doing it, always reach out to a colleague. Uh, we've gotten to a point today where we're reaching out more and more to our colleagues, our professional colleagues of getting assistance, you know, uh, and that, that wasn't necessarily the case when my dad was surveying, uh, but today I think we're getting to a point where we're actually wanting to work together. Yeah, I agree with that statement. That's, uh, I've said that a few times where, I mean, we're more friends and, and uh, you know, trying to help service the industry than we are competitors at this point, you know. Well, and, the, and these yeah. little deals like you're doing here, Trent, uh, yeah. these mentoring Mondays help out a lot. I think it breaks down that barrier exactly. uh, and it and it really kind of, if somebody like, I know George has his hand up there, but if George says, hey, I've got a project and you know, my client wants to get this done, will you be able to help me with it? And it's something maybe if I can, if I can't, if I know somebody in that region, I can send them that way. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what these little groups and these little mentoring things help with. Correct. And George, you got your hand up. So Go for it, George. So am I muted? Nope, you're good. Okay. Yeah. So I, I would have to be the first one to agree that you can't survey anywhere without knowing the history. I mean, that's that's vital. I mean, I've retraced surveys here where, you know, Nevada isn't flat anywhere. Well, very few places. I've retraced surveys where it's pretty flat east west, but slopey north south, and the surveyor laid his chain flat on the ground and, and set all these monuments. <laughs> so you fit east west, you don't fit north south, and you got to figure out why the heck, why, why you're not fitting. Uh, it, it's just, it's just amazing uh, what what you can come up with if you understand who did the survey and how they did it. Uh, did they just throw out a, a, a pin every 200 feet where they drug the chain and then they came back and put them online and just guesstimated with one guy dragging the chain with a flag on the back? I mean, it's, it's crazy the stuff you run into, but the, the history is, is so, so important. And I'm like you, I share your, I, I hated history in high school. I, I, I fell asleep in that class. I got, I, I got good marks in it, but I mean, I hated it. It was boring. And then I get a job surveying and worse yet, I get a job doing water rights, <laughs> which is researching the history back to who knows when. Uh, so fascinating and so interesting to learn who was here then and who, who they needed to and how the, how the land transpired in, in title from them. Uh, and Trent, trust, ask, check me if I'm wrong. Don't we have some property in Nevada that's now in Arizona because of the river? Uh, I would think so, yeah. I, mean, I think we've got some yeah. going back and forth there too. Yep, exactly. Uh, I think there's some in 
California down south on the uh, uh, Colorado River. Exactly. Um, yep. Those darn rivers just don't stay put. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's uh, two two really good ones in the. Uh, leave it up to Paris because Paris is famous for finding all the fraudulent surveyors. I'll go with uh, Paris's first. How many fraudulent surveyors in the state of Texas? Did you uh, find any? Is it fraudulent surveyors or surveys? Well, one and the same, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we do have quite a few. And of course, um, if you don't know, I, I've served on our board uh, as a LSLS member, but I'm, I'm serving right now as an emeritus member. Uh, and we come across a, a lot of uh, funny things, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I don't know if that I could answer that uh, because there's so many. Um, but you do find them, uh, and and even the fraudulent surveys, and, and we have court cases that deal with those uh, as well that we have to go back to uh, to reconstruct. You know, because you have to assume when you read field notes that the surveyor did what he said he did, even though he may not have. Uh, and so we have we have court cases that deal with that. Um, gotcha. To go back to George's statement real quick, I've got a little story. Uh, in Central Texas, uh, there was a German immigration uh, survey that was um, uh, established, and it was established in a similar fashion as sections. But what they did as they were surveying the sections, they broke them down into half sections, north half and south half. Um, but a colleague, and we, we set up a course out there, of course, the course is no longer there, it's called the uh, uh, Brady course, the Heart of Texas course. Um, and they were trying to find these monuments of these original land grants, and they could never find them. And um, subsequent surveys showed that the original land grants were, instead of being um, kind of square, cardinal, bearing, they had like a rooftop effect. So one set of monuments were further north than the other, uh, and then go another mile to the east, they would be further south. Uh, creating this little rooftop effect. And of course, uh, it, it dumbfounded a lot of people until um, somebody was doing some genealogy work at the land office. And a colleague of mine, if you see him right here, he's got a red cap on, an uh, older gentleman, one of my mentors. He served 20 years as a uh, survey director for the general land office. Um, and a lady doing genealogy work came to him and said, hey, I'm looking for uh, some anything, letters, whatever, from this guy. And of course, the guy was the original surveyor for that system, uh, that German immigration system. And uh, he found some of the letters uh, that were uh, that were sent, uh, and this was from the lady doing genealogy work. It was sent from him in the field to his wife uh, back east. And it stated that what he did was is he set a baseline uh, east and west baseline, and he set five field crews mile apart from each other and told them to go north until you hit the Colorado River. And as soon as you hit the Colorado River, then move five miles west and then go back south to the baseline again. Well, as you can imagine, all the rough terrain in the hill country of Texas, plus having to dodge arrows from Comanches, um, they weren't quite jiving as they were going north and they never made connecting east-west lines. And those letters that came from him writing home, exactly explaining that, helped the surveyors 50 years ago find these monuments. And so how else would they have known that unless somebody was working in the history part? That is crazy. That is awesome. That's a great story. That is cool. Uh, Schroeder was looking for the explanation between uh, basically registered surveyors and state surveyors. Okay, so we have a two-tiered system. One of our oldest systems is our LSLS. They started examining LSLS's in 1919. Uh, but the, uh, an LSLS is a licensed state land surveyor. And, and a licensed state land surveyor is duly qualified to work under the authority of the Texas Land Commissioner. So all the only people allowed to file field notes are the state surveyors, just kind of like a BLM cadastral surveyor. 
uh, but we are in private practice. Um, so the only time we get called up to do anything like that is if there's any curative needs like a vacancy or if you want to file for uh, excess on a, on a grant, uh, you'd file for a deed of acquittance. So they would have to have additional field notes. Or if the land office just needs some work done on their behalf, they'll hire the 59 licensed state land surveyors to do that. Um, and the uh, RPLS, the Registered Professional Land Surveyor, is your regular everyday surveyor providing services to the public. Now today, you can't be a licensed state land surveyor without being a, a registered professional surveyor. Um, and, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, 1919 started the uh, licensed state land surveyor. Before that, they were appointed uh, as state surveyors, but now they're, now they're uh, duly qualified by last examining. Um, and then 1955 came the registered uh, professional surveyor. Perfect. Anybody else got anything else? No more questions. <laughs> it's quiet. I'm still shocked that all of those records made it through all the fires or the wars or, you know, through yeah, all that and never really got, uh, never got lost. That's crazy. Yeah. Sure. And, I, have, and, I have a question for, for uh, Professor Edwards. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious, how, how would you, how would you, um, guess how would you stake out that, that water boundary or if, do you just record its its mean sea level, or or you how how do you because I I'm just having a hard time envisioning how you would record that on a map, and then the following flood season it changes again. So how how are people keeping track of that extent? Okay, uh, and you're talking about a river. Yes, sir. Okay, so the river is a boundary. Uh, and the meanders of the rivers, any sinuosity of that river is the boundary. The only reason that we make calls on it is just to get the acres but but when a river moves uh, let's say it's moving through accretion and and i like using the definition out of the blm manual uh, that's a grain by grain imperceptible uh change of the river um so through time uh i i run the meanders of the river but i date it uh, so if if it's i've run it on march the 10th and that's the date that it's getting. And it's subject to change. You may lose it, you may gain it, uh, but I don't mark it because the river is the natural boundary. Uh, you mark, you put any marks out there, you just confuse the landowner. Uh, uh, and we don't wanna do that. Um, but there are cases where, you know, an avulsion may occur uh, and you may have to try to determine uh, that avulsion event uh, and, and to identify ancient, uh, channels may be your job. Uh, and I find myself doing that uh, frequently, uh, trying to identify evulsive events. And, and can you identify it using record information or satellite imagery, which is the best thing that came around? But we didn't have satellites 100 years ago. Uh, so it makes it more difficult to try to track something that an event that may have happened 100 years ago. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, you know, in Texas, we use, uh, you know, the gradient boundary uh, on navigable rivers. Uh, and that's, that's a completely different, you know, four hour session later on. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, it's like an ordinary high water mark in a lot of states. Uh, it's real similar to the same, except it's not a, it's not a, a, a visual based deal. It's more scientific. Um, but, uh, does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, yes. I got, I got, uh, I guess. So I'm just trying to have a hard time. I'm, I'm having a hard time trying to see how, how these boundaries are, are recorded on a, uh, on a project base. Um, yeah, it, it, it's subject to move. When you have a natural uh, river as a, as a call, uh, it's, it's going to move with whatever the ebb and flow of that river decides, uh, which makes it all the more difficult to you know, pinpoint, okay, you got 10 acres. And then, you know, 20 years from now, you, you got 20 acres, you know, where'd it come from? Oh, well, it moved, the river moved. <laughs> nice. There you go, <laughs> perfect. Well, I uh, definitely appreciate the time. It was a uh, great, great, uh, great history and 
hopefully we can kind of maybe pull out another little section and dive into it a little bit more or whatever, but just a quick uh, 30,000 foot overview is uh, fantastic. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have anything, Pat? I just saw you unmute, but. Nope. Okay. nope. Just wanted to say excellent presentation. Yeah, it's great stuff. Thank you. I love it. Uh, Schroeder, usually. Yeah. Got that's it. same here. Yep. That's uh that's coming from Alaska. Schroeder's in Alaska. So yeah. Perfect. Sweet. Well, I thank everybody's time and uh we will be back again next Monday. I appreciate yeah. it. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Davey. Thanks, Davey. Thanks, Trent, for making this happen. No worries, bud. Have a good day. See ya. Bye.